Sí, sí funciona, ¿verdad? Muy buenas tardes. Este, vamos a iniciar la sesión de hoy en la tarde con Jenny Hirsch. Eh, bueno, Jenny es del Maryland Institute College of Art, como ven ahí. Y pues adelante. Okay. Thank you and thank you for the invitation. Encountering British filmmaker Steve McQueen's installation Charlotte of 2004 demands a lot of its spectators. The glowing red 16 millimeter short comprises a six minute discomforting close up of iconic British actress Charlotte Rampling's eye and the surrounding soft flesh of her lid intermittently manipulated by the artist's own indelicate finger that continually threatens to probe the surface of her eyeball. The installation, haunted by the rhythmic movement and rattling sound of its slim but imposing anthropomorphic projector atop a, atop a pedestal, along with the film's subject matter itself, sets up a series of complementary and contradictory impulses about film, the physicality of the medium, and its capacity to affect spectators' senses and emotions. In a work that fuses the tactile with the visual, male aggression with female submission, youth with old age, corporeality with flatness, and the organic with the mechanical, McQueen conflates a series of binary oppositions that not only rehearse a series of metaphors connected to the eye and the camera, as well as looking at images in general, but also self-reflexively interrogates the experience and medium of cinema itself, all the while taking the spectator on a historical journey through iconic cinematic moments that is itself a tour de force. But before thinking through how the formal dimensions and thematic concerns of the installation pose a series of deeper questions about cinema, I should first contextualize McQueen's lesser known work by parsing the film's allusions to a number of key works in film history. Outside of art history, most people have come to know McQueen through his acclaimed feature films of the last seven years. McQueen re received critical attention for his 2008 film Hunger, starring Michael Fassbender as Bobby Sands, who led the second IRA hunger strike in 1981. His 2011 film Shame, also starring Fassbender, which chronicled the sexual addiction of a New York businessman whose sexual potency was undermined by emotional intimacy. And most recently, his 2013 Academy Award winning 12 Years a Slave, which which is a filmic adaptation of Solomon Northrup's slave memoir published in 1853. But despite his rapid climb to success in the more general public sphere, McQueen has continued to make smaller scaled filmic works as evidenced by his beautiful two channel 30 minute film Giardini commissioned by the UK pavilion for the 2009 Venice Biennale and his more recent 2014 two channel video piece Ashes a poignant memorial to a young man who lost his life as a result of drug lords and poverty in Granada from where McQueen's own parents hail. Charlotte is part of a more intimately fo focused series of works that take up similar issues of power, violence, and social structures in, wh in which they operate. But at first glance, Charlotte recalls a number of feature films and artworks. With a title confirming the film's subject, name, the, work focuses, the work's focus on Rampling's vulnerable aging eye readily conjures the British actress's roles as a quintessential victim in two often linked Italian-made films about Nazism. First, in her role as the deported and eventually executed at Dachau young wife of a leftist German who resisted the Nazi, the Nazi politics to which the rest of his family, driven by Green, greed succumbed in Lucchino Visconti's The Damned of 1969, and second, perhaps more famously, as the survivor of an abusive sadomasochistic concentration camp era relationship that assume, ensues again after the war in Liliana Cavani's controversial night, The Night Porter of 1974. In both films, actor Dirk Bogard plays the stock, malevolent counterpart to Rampling's innocent, weak, and helpless characters. In this shot, one sees just one example of the prodding, poking, and otherwise phallic gestures that, Bargo, that Bogard makes throughout the film in scenes with Rampling 
that are shot, that are supposed to depict in, scenes from during the war and later as they reenact their relationship in 1957 Vienna. McQueen's finger, which hovers over and around just skirting Rampling's eyeball, instantly alludes to such threatening penetrative moments in Cavani's film, which much to the chagrin of ethical voices like Italian writer Primo Levi, explore the dynamic between victim and perpetrator as if the two roles are two inextricably linked sides of the same coin that fuses two equally willing participants. But at the level of composition, the film immediately recalls two other important works. Most obviously, it echoes the scene in Luis Buñuel and Salvador Dali's 1929 surrealistic expose, Un Chien Andalou, 1929, sorry, best known for its infamous close-up shot of an eye sliced by a razor blade. Yet the menacing exploratory movements of McQueen's chubby finger also recall Vito Acconci's Pryings of 1971, the video recording of a performance at New York University during which the artist repeatedly grasped and restrained his then girlfriend and performance partner, Kathy Dillon, as he attempted to pry open her eyes with his own indelicate fingers. Shot to include fuller views of their bodies than we had seen in McQueen's film, Prines captures a bodily power struggle between the sexes whose ultimate goal, at least for Akanchi, was to make her see. The sounds of their scuffle, shoes hitting the floor and heavy breathing, embellish the 17-minute film uh, which pit Akanchi's aggressive action against Dylan's persistent resistance. Akanchi manages to impose violent actions upon her, but she holds her own and with little exception keeps her eyes shut. In Charlotte, however, Rampling is a more passive recipient of McQueen's prodding gesture, which seems to be set on a less equal playing field. Here we witness a slower, more deliberate series of manual inquisitive gestures. Raging's, Rampling's aging, less elastic skin sticking in the positions into which McQueen has directed it as if soft clay formed by a sculptor's hand. Charlotte thus not only stages a male-female binary, but also juxtaposes deposes the youthful virility of the director with the tired, worn-out flesh of his subject who does not resist. Arguably, in conversation with all of these filmic works, which likewise dapple in the darkness of desire with their arb arguably difficult-to-watch scenes, McQueen's work intimately yet publicly engages and at times nearly abstracts Rampling's body as a premise for excavating and extending those films ontological as well as phenomenological exploration of cinema's ability to stage ethical concerns through corporeal means that oscillate between it and conflate the haptic, optic, and sonic. It is this conflation of references to feature films and early video work in an installation context that makes the work stand out and ultimately pose a set of larger questions about the role of the spectator in a cinematic work. Aside from its connections both to the cinematic persona associated with Rampling and its formal ties to Buñuel Dali's and Akanchi's aforementioned films, Charlotte follows a series of works by McQueen in which he explores related notions of power, violence, and the sexualization of both. Bear of 1993, his second film produced while still a student at Goldsmiths, um, in that film, McQueen solely wrestles with another black man as both naked and hence vulnerable men perform what appear, appears to be more of a dance than a physical conflict. Engaged both physically and psychologically, their eye contact and glistening sweaty bodies fill the homoerotically charged screen as we witness their elegant physical effort in the absence of sound. Highlighting the visual over the sonic allows McQueen to isolate and hence emphasize the ways in which their bodies act react, and repeat an ongoing looped pas de deux. Deadpan of 1997 is also devoid of sound. Here the, wit here the viewer witnesses the harrowing anxiety of waiting for the facade of a barn-like structure to fall over and pass the artist who does not move. The anticipation of the informed spectator who links the image to Buster Keaton's silent comedy Steamboat Bill of 1928 transforms into a mixture of relief and confusion as the crashing architecture gracefully falls to the ground around the statue-like human artist who seems frozen yet nonplussed by the experience. As spectators, we notice and are unnerved by the absence of the sounds that should accompany the images. 
McQueen's 1998 film, Something Old, Something New, Something Borrowed, Something Blue, continues his repression of sound and allows instead the artist's hand as it, and, and features instead the artist's hand as it crawls along the ground. Projected onto the ground when viewed properly, the film, the film tracks a human hand moving forward, hungrily, hungrily clutching and releasing its fingers as it moves along to cover more ground. A minimalist gesture whose title refers to the things, according to a 19th century English couplet, that a bride should have on her wedding day, McQueen's hand thus takes on sexualized overtones, not only in terms of it alluding to a groom potentially exploring and taking possession of his bride's body, but also as an agent of masturbation. This two-minute looped film suggests the persistence and relentlessness of his Sisyphean gesture. Cold Breath from the next year, 1999, is a 10-minute looped film that features a close-up shot of the artist's nipple, which he perpetually fondles with his own thumb. Extending the artist's masturbatory and sexually charged exploitation of a minimalist connection between two body parts, McQueen casts himself as both the producer and recipient of pleasure stage in an erogenous zone. Though, since the film is also without sound, the spectator is denied any confirmation of the artist's bodily response to his own gesture in the way of breathing or noise. The spectator voyeur is trapped in another relentless loop of what seems to be increasingly an increasingly uncomfortable gesture that over time transforms from producing pleasure into pain and in formal terms prefigures the endlessly prod, prodded and massaged eyelid that would later define Charlotte. Turning to McQueen's Illuminae of 2001 suggests a turning point in this arc of short works about intimacy within McQueen's oeuvre. This 15-minute, also looped work is a video that McQueen made spontaneously while staying in a hotel room in France. All that we see is a shot of a bed in a hotel room, intermittently lit by the glowing light emitted by the television set on which the artist had set his camera and accompanied uh, his camera, accompanied by the ambient sound emanating from the television broadcast. A single impromptu shot, the work oscillates between a dark room to a, and a softly lit one, as, the, as we can barely detect the artist's body moving in and out of the frame as he comes in to lie on the bed and watch a program about the US invasion in, in Afghanistan. A barely audible compilation of English and French, the sounds of war and training, Illuminae both grants and denies access to image and sound as it explores not only imp the impersonal aesthetics of, the hotel, of hotel rooms, but also the predictable and perfunctory activities that unfold in those spaces. At the same time, the shot of the bed suggests a kind of potential intimacy, alluding to a work by Felix Gonzalez Torres from 10 years earlier that captures the fleeting connections and enduring memories of corporeal intimacy as registered by the indexical signs of now absent bodies. While this work memorializes two bodies rather than one, McQueen's work also attends to this body-bed relation that's universal. Illuminae results in an image whose sound is not about what we see, but rather a product of the technology enabling the faceless fi figure, whom we know to be McQueen, to, so to tune in, so to speak. The work thus connects not only the behavior of its subject, but also in the power, with the power of the television set to transport the viewer to foreign places, always mediated by the lens, the camera, the commentator, and the broadcast. As the different components of the television program rattle on as a sort of background noise and the images send out artificial colors of the video produced light, the viewer's attention turns as much to the notion of the machines and in that sense an endless chain of technology both in the room and beyond that underpin the televising as the person who is mesmerized by them drifts off into sleep against unfamiliar sheets and mattress made comfortable perhaps only by the removal of the lights that might otherwise remind him of, his, of the fact that he's amongst unfamiliar surroundings. This privileging of the sound of the machine over the human subject marks a turning point that I believe lays the groundwork for what is the more philosophical and ontological as opposed to mimetic aspect about what we see in Charlotte. It was for this reason that I wanted to present a talk on a panel with the title Aesthetic Apparatus Techniques, the Material and the Sensitive, in order to put Charlotte into a broader context, notwithstanding its provocative citations of the works outlined in the first part of my talk, 
or in the second part of the talk, Charlotte's position within McQueen's longer trajectory of works that explore isolated bodily gestures and the connotations they carry, as well as his exploration of sound and what Oquian Wazer has called its evacuation in his films. As an acclaimed multimedia artist filmmaker who's worked with various types of moving and still image technology, including 16 millimeter film, 35 millimeter film, video, sculpture, and still photography, McQueen has produced works that not only engage viewers to contemplate carefully his chosen medium, but also through their highly charged content, touch upon their spectators' emotions through a range of senses. Charlotte, by using, by virtue of its execution in a dated type of film, 16 millimeter, alludes to an arc of film and video work that stretches from 1929 to 1974, thus simultaneously traveling across technological as well as theatrical ground. Like many contemporary artists, McQueen is conscious of the communal roots of cinema, that is to say the theater, where it was always perhaps uncomfortable to see certain actions, behaviors, and events in the presence of others, despite the fact that one would sit in the dark. This return to the 16 millimeter instantiates a self-reflexive gesture that connects the work's content as well as its form to its own historical roots. By including the rhythmically rattling projector whose position on a pedestal endows the machine with an anthropomorphic air, McQueen stages a conversation between director, actor, and spectator that uses the display space of an art gallery or museum to challenge boundaries between the work of art and spectator, while at the same time probing the line between what is an art object, a sculptural installation that contains moving images, the film as object, and its generator, and what is mass media or cinema, at least by suggestion. As the image of Rampling's eye shoots across to the, op to the opposing wall, the spectator stands next to, behind, and perhaps in front of her mechanical counterpart, the projector. She may close her own eyes, okay. but the relentless robotic projector continues to pierce the space with its red-hot, fraught image. The image in which Rampling is perpetually subjected to the inquisitive, investigative, and invasive presence of McQueen's manual manipulations but the engaged spectator of Charlotte is by definition never simply a spectator of that film. Rather, her attention is forever split between the unremitting, discomforting action that appears against the wall and the distracting, automatic motions of the projector whose bodily presence threatens her as much as McQueen's finger does Rampling's helpless, tired, and aging eye. Standing rather than sitting alongside, behind, and in the midst of this orchestration, M McQueen McQueen's spectator is forced to confront his insistence on the arrangement of the installation, which shifts the parameters of traditional cinema and builds in a physical rather than merely visual dimension to the experience of viewing. As one's legs tire and mind grows increasingly anxious, one's body engages in a relational connection with the projector and is drawn into the physical as well as cultural systems that work in and around Charlotte. Ultimately, I'm interested in how McQueen uses this minimalistic cinematic gesture to revert back to and emphasize older technology in order to ask poignant questions in 2004 about the ambiguous status of moving, moving images in contemporary culture. Finally, in closing, I turn very briefly to Giorgio Agamben's notion of an apparatus as a means of considering how moving images such as McQueen's change when considered within an art as well as cinematic system, a system that is a larger network. In making Charlotte, McQueen thus seems to meditate on where cinema is now, thus posing a series of questions about where cinema has traveled and how it has engaged a singular combination of questions about gender, power, age, race, and spectatorship through its particular technological and historical trajectory, through its dual status as an art and a mass medium as he blurs the boundaries between those two spheres. These systems encompass and engage not just the filmmaker and his viewing public, but also the larger cultural and political and indeed politicized context of the histories of film, their reception, individual actors, and the sites of viewing. To conclude, I call your attention to a short excerpt from an interview conducted by um, contemporary art curator Carlos Basualdo in 2001 on the occasion of a McQueen exhibition at the ICA in London. When asked how he felt about fixed as opposed to moving images, McQueen stated the following. What interested me about static images is that you could grab them. 
you could hold them. You could fix some kind of impression on them. But if the image was moving, even if it was moving only slightly, it was almost like, as I've said before, a wet piece of soap. You had to sort of adjust yourself in order to catch it. So that was my main interest, image and movement, and how both can go together to create something flexible. What I realized was that you don't need a great deal of movement to create a narrative. A blink of an eye is enough. Perhaps he already had Charlotte on his mind. Comentarios, preguntas. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us about the role of race in in this particular. Uh, work because it's also present in, in one of the movies that he got the Oscar. So could you uh -huh. talk about that? Mm -hmm. um, that's this is like a whole other can of worms, but I will I'll talk about it a little bit. I think this is a work where I don't think race is particularly obvious when you see it. You don't necessarily know immediately that that's his finger. You don't necessarily get a sense. You do get a sense that the skin color is a little bit darker, but I don't think that that's sort of the the big emphasis in this particular work. Um, I mean, I think, and I've read and watched a lot of interviews with him, and although I think a lot of his topics, I mean, most recently, 12 Years a Slave, obviously that's about race and about the fraught history of race in the United States. I think a lot of his work is more universally cast about power structures, if that makes sense. And so, in some works, I think that plays out more strongly at the level of race. I don't know that I think it plays out particularly strongly in this work. Unless one relates that back to, in a certain way, Charlotte as being this victim in those films, although she's not actually victimized because she's Jewish, despite the fact those films are set in Nazi Germany. So I don't know if that answers your question. If this is coming in Spanish, give me a second to turn this on. No, I'll ask in English, don't okay. worry. Okay. <laughs> I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit. I liked your choice of words that discomforting and not discomforting. If you could elaborate a little bit on the relationship of this not fitting the spectator and the presence of the projector. Um, you uh -huh. went there a little bit, but... Yeah, well, hmm. I mean, they are different words, and they're words that I have... You, you picked up on something I've thought about for a long time, more so in the context of a certain group of Italian films, of which The Dam, The Night Porter, um, Seven Beauties. There's a range of films in Italy between, I would say, 1969 and 1976 that kind of tackle fascism in a way that made them controversial films because they used non-traditional modes to do so. In other words, they either used humor, they used burlesque, they were very Baroque. And I think that that kind of exaggeration results in a kind of unnerving of the spectator. The spectator isn't ready for it. And I guess I think in this particular work, I think that McQueen really got that in thinking about Charlotte Rampling's sort of experience as an actress in those films. And, and I think he, ex he was able to replicate that because when you see this, I saw this um, in a museum in Chicago, you feel a little bit put off by the, by the projector. You feel like it somehow must be drowning out sound that's not really coming out of the actual image. You're, you want that, you want to know something else. So I don't, I don't know if that helps, but but the difference in the word is important to me. It's a great choice of wording. So I'll try to do it in English, so it will be easier. What I think it's really interesting of McQueen is that his work as an artist is, and I, I don't know if we can do that uh, distinction, it's really interesting in terms of the production and the apparatus, in a way. And his work as a filmmaker it's much more conservative, in a way. 
also. As, as a feature filmmaker? Yeah, uh -huh. let's say, uh -huh. well, like, I don't know if we can draw that distinction between artist work and mm -hmm. filmmaker from Hollywood or something. Yeah. But there's something really intriguing for me in his work in that sense, because I think his work as an artist, it's really intriguing in this relationship with the camera, the apparatus, or the, or the notion of the image. And in his work as a filmmaker, it's much more conservative. Traditional. If, even the, mm -hmm. the other thing that you, you, you pointed out, the notion, the sound. I mean, in these works, he's stretching this relationship also in the sound. And in this movie, you have this kind of really... Well, I think in the, in the feature films, he's, he's also, he's working with narrative. And I think that's really different. Yeah, but I, I was only wondering if you yeah. can expand a little bit more in the notion of the apparatus, because maybe there's something in, in it that can relate with the specifics of his work in art that can be interesting, that can be different also from the other things. And if there's I, th an, I, think I, I think I understand the question. I mean, I think in the feature films, and I, and I don't like to... I really don't like to go after artist in artistic intent. It's not, some, it's not like a road I go down often. But I, I don't think his goal, my sense in the feature films, is to kind of interrogate the Hollywood system at all. I think he's trying to pick up on these kind of, you know, in the case of 12 Years a Slave, a particular story that he wants to tell, but also these power structures that have always been a point of interest for him in his work. I think in the sort of his early works as a student and the works that he kind of produces for the gallery system before that are, uh, are a form of art that's looking into the, the apparatus of, of the medium as opposed to this maybe the cinema system. I, I think that this particular film is probably, well, that's not true actually because Deadpan does it too. He's interested in the history of cinema but I don't think the feature films are engaged in that same kind of exploration of this larger network and system as a, as a means of kind of being a contemporary commentator and critic of his own medium. I don't, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that in his work of art, he's making a critique of the image and the production of the image mm -hmm. in the art system. And in his I think film it, then work, the reception of the image, I think, yeah. also. But in his film work, it's just like a normative way to produce image, which is quite, there's a tension at least. I, well, I mean, I guess for me, that one way to resolve that is that that's one of the reasons he hasn't stopped making the artworks. Like that film, Ashes, was a kind of, I don't know if has anyone has seen that or knows about that work, but that work was, it's, I showed you in my slide two images, but it was it's kind of a bad slide. If I, if I own up to the truth, because the images, I'm just moving back so I can show you. Um, where is it? Sorry. So those images are projected back to back on one screen and the sound of each image floods into the different parts of the room in which you view it. And on one side you have um, an image taken several years ago when McQueen was in Granada to make Carib's Leap, which is a film, which was one of two films he made for Documenta 11 in 2002. And his cinematographer just happened to take pictures of this young man named Ashes as he was riding on, his, on a boat. Um, when McQueen went back rather recently, he, found, he asked after Ashes and found out that Ashes had passed away as a result of a conflict over finding drugs. And he ended up making a film. And so the, the second part of the film, McQueen shot himself, which is of um, these people building a grave for him. And so on one half, you hear a narrative of what happened to this guy. and the other half, you see this older footage. Um, and he's still making works like that, that I think think about this, that sort of apparatus. Bueno. I think we have to yeah? okay. <laughs> move on. Thank you very much, Jenny. Thank <laughs> you.